Hi everyone, Brian Lewis here with Kidney Can. It's my pleasure to welcome you back to another joint edition of the National Kidney Foundation and Kidney Can's NKF Live series. Today, we're discussing the topic of nutrition and eating well. My guests today include Meryl Uranga, who's a patient from Atlanta, Georgia, along with Francesca Maglione, who's a cancer and oncology dietitian from New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell. Welcome both of you. Thank you, thank you. Great to have you here. So we're gonna dive right in today. Um, folks watching in, we're gonna try to break up today and we're gonna be talking about nutrition, but also get ready, we're gonna have some resources for diets and for some recipes and maybe some kitchen help as well as some, some exercise and other resource information. Um, so to dive right in, you know, when we talk about kidney cancer, many times we talk about sort of the phase prior to getting what's called a nephrectomy and then there's after surgery getting a nephrectomy in the post-surgical time, and then there's living well. So we're gonna to try to break today's discussion up into that. So let me read a, a, a quick quote on the kidneys. So the kidneys have long been known to play an important role in the metabolism of sugars, proteins, fats, and other nutrients, in addition to being one of the most energy demanding organs in the body. So Francesca, I'm gonna start with you. Tell us a little bit about the kidneys. Where are they? What do they do? Sure, yeah, so the kidneys are located um, under the rib cage in the back of the body. They're small organs, about like five inches each, and they are very busy. They are basically filtering all of the blood in the body throughout the whole day and removing toxins so that that could be removed through the urine. Um, so they're very important to the whole body's functioning. Great, great. So going back to our segments about pre-surgery and post-surgery, Meryl, you and I both had nephrectomies. Mm -hmm. Neither of us had a lot of time to get ready for the surgery, That's so right. I didn't have any nutrition planning ahead of time. Did you? I did not. Um, I was sort of in a whirlwind uh, getting an appendectomy and then followed up by a nephrectomy all within a few weeks, so that came for me afterwards. But um, it's worth noting that nowadays a standard of care for nephrectomy um, in the age of immunotherapy is often delay, way more delayed, so it would be more relevant um, to a lot of patients now versus five years ago when I had mine, um, that there would be some, diet, time. some kind of time and um, counseling opportunities in terms of nutrition. Great, well, that's a good segue. Francesca, can you give us some examples of what you might talk to a patient about who's getting ready to face a nephrectomy or surgery? Sure. So whenever I meet with any patients or if you at home are going to meet meeting with a dietitian, you're going to have an assessment and then a plan will be made for you and it's going to be individualized. But some of the key parts of this that are the same for everyone are going to be a high protein diet. So eating more fish, eggs, meat, beans, dairy, just any ways that you could get that protein in before the surgery is gonna help with your recovery. And then staying hydrated is extremely important as well to help with the surgery process. Great, great, okay. And so just to clarify a term or terms here, we talk about nutrition, but we also hear the words malnutrition and <coughs> undernutrition. Can you chat about that for a second? Sure, so malnutrition is somewhat of an umbrella term, but really mostly when we're using it, in the context of kidney cancer, we're talking about undernutrition. And undernutrition could mean that you're not eating enough food overall, or you're not eating enough of specific foods that are essential for your body's nourishment. Great, and one of the things I wanna emphasize, and maybe Meryl, you can talk about is, we talk at Kidney Can a lot about getting a care team together, and which includes the dietitian. Can you talk about your care team when you first were diagnosed and what you went through? Yeah, I um, I kind of switched care teams pretty early on and was able to get into like a multifunctional uh, center where I was able to um, and have a consult with a ne nephrologist for you know just general kidney assessment once I was you know, down to having one kidney is just a little bit different. Um, life is generally the same, but there's a lot more monitoring that goes on. Um, and I did have an initial dietary consultant. I have not had that on an ongoing basis, but did a lot of research on my own and have, uh, have worked on that as well. And um, now and then there are other uh, players in that, in that on team. that team, yeah. 
Well, let's stick with the, the dietitian for a moment here. So it's before or, or dur right around surgery, and you've, you're consulting with a, with a patient and talking to them. Can you tell us what, what an official nutrition assessment looks like? Yeah, sure. So I'm going to ask about any food allergies or food intolerances, so things that you can't have. I'm going to ask what you eat and drink on a normal day. If you're taking any nutrition or dietary supplements, or if you're interested in taking any, I want to know about that as well. I ask about what fluids you drink, how you move your body, if you do any physical activity, who's cooking, who's doing the food shopping. I ask about food access. Do you have resources to get food? Do you have enough money to get food? Do you feel like you run out of food? Because a big factor is, um, you know, you can know all the right foods to eat, but if you can't access those foods, there's a disconnect there. And I ask what foods people like and don't like. I ask about what symptoms they have, if they're having nausea, if they're having diarrhea. And we take all of that into account when we're making somebody's plan. Okay. And so I also, you know, we hear the term BMI for body mass index. Can you just dis discuss that as part of the nutrition assessment? Sure, yeah. So I usually ask people what their usual weight is. I'll say, what's, what's normal for you? And I find that that is more important than someone's BMI because people could be healthy and nourished at all different heights and weights and combinations of the two, which is essentially what BMI is. BMI is a ratio of your height compared to your weight. And we have different categories for those numbers. It'll be underweight, normal weight, overweight, or obese. And honestly, in my assessments, we're not really looking at those numbers that much. They don't have that much meaning in the nutrition plan. So people shouldn't feel worried about their BMI so much, which is a good thing to know. People sometimes get a little worried about that. Great, great. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit as we move towards the post-surgery phase of our discussion. Here's another quote I wanted to read. Generally speaking, the best way to eat in order to have an optimal nutritional status is to include a wide variety of foods in our daily intake. Is this a safe statement to say? Very safe, I love this statement. <laughs> okay, well here, I'll keep going. There's no such thing as a miracle food, there's no anti-cancer food, and no single ingredient contains all the essential nutrients that our body needs, so we must include them all in our diet. Fruits, vegetables, and grains. It sounds like I was back in elementary school here. <laughs> you agree with that? Absolutely. And how about you, Meryl? You... Oh yeah, balance is everything. Um, and it, not just for your physical well-being and nutrients, but for your soul as well. Um, being able to enjoy food, enjoy life, um, as well as take care of your body is, is pretty essential because it affects your stress level, which is a whole other piece of the pie here that you want to control. Yeah, I, I remember I um, had a, had cravings every once in a while for, of all things, Reese's Pieces. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, yeah, call me crazy. But um, one of the things I, I noticed is when I um, was trying to eat sort of a well-balanced diet of across the different food groups, um, I kept asking my doctors, you know, do I need to do more of this or less of that? And the one word that they kept saying is moderation, moderation. You can just have about just about anything within moderation. Is that a, a fair statement? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a fair statement. And I, I think, you know, the variety also has to deal with not just, you know, making sure you're having all the different foods, but variety because what you like and what I like and what Meryl likes is gonna be completely different. Your cravings are gonna be different. And so that leaves room for variety. Different seasons, different foods are available. Um, different cultures, different food norms, um, food allergies are gonna also lend itself to someone's diet variety. Great, and so it sounds like if you go a little bit off of the, uh, of the plan, you're not gonna get into too much trouble, hopefully. No, absolutely not. <laughs> any, any times you went off the, off the reservation a little uh, bit? I've gone off the reservation a time or two. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, I look at that as uh, part of my mental health care too, because I do wanna live and enjoy my life and not be restrictive all the time. And um, I find that that really keeps me balanced most, a great majority of the time. Yeah, I, one of the things, my wife went off and bought like 20 books on healthy eating for us and 
Um, we tried to stick to some of them, but I found that if you just sort of stay sort of within the boundaries of what, what common sense says, you're, you're going to be pretty good. Mm -hmm. But you can occasionally veer off, it sounds mm -hmm. like, and, and I get in too much trouble. Definitely. Great, mm -hmm. great. So just touching on that, you know, I, I know, you know, as part of nutrition, there's other aspects, including, you know, your soul and your well-being and your mental health and, your, and the psychosocial impact that all of this has on it. Any, any comments or any thoughts on telling folks out there, you know, hey, in addition to nutrition, be doing a few other things? Um, I am a huge advocate for physical activity um, with cancer, you know, what you're able to do. Um, I, know, I know that that varies greatly depending on the treatment and, you know, where you're at in, in the journey of, of dealing with cancer. But if you're able to, there's a lot of data that exists um, that points to the fact that longevity and survival in cancer is related to activity. And... I know that's been a huge priority for me, and it's also very good for um, attitude, for endorphins and feeling good and being active and being productive. And I, I can't say enough good things about, you know, again, it's always balanced, right. balancing the, a good physical fitness program, whatever you like to do. I've just recently started biking. And if you would have told me I'd be biking five and a half years <laughs> into cancer and, you know, at my age and everything else, I'd be like, yeah, sure, but I am, and I'm, I'm loving it, and I do a lot of walking, and um, I do watch my diet, but I also enjoy my life, so. Excellent, well, mm -hmm. look out, Tour de France, here comes Meryl. <laughs> uh, all right, any, any advice in, in, in terms of yoga, Pilates, any of those kind of exercise, meditation things that you counsel clients on, mm -hmm. Francesca? Yep, so I think I think food and exercise go together. So if someone's working on getting nourished, if they're not eating enough, I always say that's a good starting place. Work on getting your protein intake up, getting your calorie intake up, and then you have a little bit more fuel in the tank to start doing some exercise. And I always have people start small. Chair yoga on YouTube, most of the videos are free and they're excellent. Um, chair dance videos, start sitting down and engage your muscles that way. That's a great way to start. And meditation is also a great thing to combine with physical activity and your food choices. Helps with stress, helps with your, your mind, your mental attitude, can help with pain. Some other things that can actually complete the circle impact appetite. Um, so the physical activity, the mindfulness, can impact pain, right? Pain impacts appetite. And then we kind of have that whole cycle. So everything's really related. And that's like another place that the moderation comes in is because it's not just doing 100% of the diet. It's about doing a little bit of the diet changes, a little bit of the physical activity changes, a little bit of the mindfulness changes. Yeah, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. I just wanted to, to say that I would caution that be very easy on yourself and be very kind to yourself because uh, Nephrectomy recovery is very difficult, and I found it extremely difficult in terms of food and appetite and being able to get the nutrients that I needed. It was, it was a good long while before I, I would say I had a normal appetite, and so just be prepared, you know, have people that are helping you, caregivers or whatnot, you know, bring you the things that you can tolerate. Um, you may not tolerate a whole lot. Uh, there's just, it's just a very, in my experience, it was a very difficult time and other people that I've spoken to and that, you know, you're, go you're going to need to recover from that, but that that recovery will take place. And like, I, I was, my daughter was helping me during the time that um, I was recovering and all I ever wanted to eat was avocado toast. Now I can't even look at avocado <laughs> toast. <laughs> I think I ate it every day for several weeks. <laughs> but um, it just, you know, have grace with yourself and, and you, will, you will get your strength back and you will be able yeah. to, uh, to work yeah, up to I, that. I, I remember vividly um, coming home from the hospital and it was Thanksgiving and it was the two days leading up to Thanksgiving and the house was filled with smells <laughs> and I couldn't eat a bit of it no. at first, but slowly it, it, you, re you regain that. Um, so let's, um, and I, I've also heard that, you know, nutrition in general helps you cope better during, you know, the, if, you're, if you're following your plan, and it also can help to a, a quicker recovery overall. Is that 
Yep, absolutely. So if you're eating well and you're doing some movement, that's really gonna help support your muscle mass. So how much muscle you have in your body and having more of that muscle mass has been shown to reduce the toxicities that you get from treatment, which basically just means the symptoms from the treatment and also can help with the outcomes from treatment and with reoccurrence risk. So it's really important. Okay, so I think we're segueing into the after surgery time and, and rebuilding I'm hearing. Um, for those folks watching, we have a couple of resources out there that we wanna share with you. They should be coming on the screen every once in a while. And one of them is a resource called Cook For Your Life, which was um, drawn up by the Fred Hutchins, Hutch uh, Hospital out in Seattle. It's got a ton of great information on recipes, meal plans, depending on, on types of food you like and dislike. I think it's a highly recommended to take a look at that. And also there's an organization called the IKCC, the International Kidney Cancer Coalition, and they have a cookbook a recipe book also uh, out there for kidney cancer patients. And so take a look at that if you have some time. It's got a lot of great information and, a, and ways to cook and take care of your body. So moving on to, um, I heard, you know, at least for me, um, others, you lose a lot of muscle or some muscle after surgery. You're sort of lying around a lot. What What are some of the things you need? Protein, correct? What anything else you can advise around that? Yep, great question. So a lot of people think it's just protein. Protein is very important because that is the building blocks of your muscles. However, we also need carbohydrates because that's the energy for your body to do all of its normal functioning and rebuild that muscle and have enough energy to do the exercise to rebuild that muscle. So that's really important. Plus fruits and vegetables kind of always come in because that's gonna give you those vitamin and minerals which play a role in that energy metabolism as well. All right, I'm gonna uh, ask you, Meryl, you just mentioned that, that there were some foods that you were able to tolerate and avocado to toast was <laughs> one of them. Any others that you, you come back to? I, um, I have been all over the place. I ate sort of a vegan, actually not sort of, but I ate a vegan diet for a, a while. I did not agree with my, my body. I was not getting enough protein and I had some fallout from that. Um, just personal experience. I know a lot of people choose that. Um, didn't work for me energy wise or nutritionally. Um, I have had, I have and have had many food aversions that I didn't used to have. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, and, and we, we can get into that because it's kind of a good transition into the fact that when you're on certain cancer drugs, therapies and treatments, which with kidney cancer can be an ongoing, it's not like a stop start chemotherapy situation um, where a lot of cancers are treated. It, with kidney cancer, we're often treated on a long-term basis and so we have to deal with side effects that are definitely impacting to your gastrointestinal system, mm. to your appetite, to your uh, food aversions and cravings and stuff like that. So you just kind of have to go with it and it, it changes all the time. Okay. Okay. Um, it, sometimes there's really no rhyme or reason to it. You could be going weeks and just fine and then you something comes up. So that, that is a challenge um, that anyone who is on either a TKI drug or immunotherapy, um, which are the ongoing treatments for kidney cancer that we'll, they'll be dealing with right. and can be a, a nutrition well, let's, roadblock. I'm gonna come back to those because I think we're gonna dive into that with a little bit of the living with yeah. kidney cancer. Just a, a couple of science type questions. Sodium, I understand, is is one is a troublemaker with mm -hmm. with this. And we can you give us any insights on on what we should do? Monitor our sodium sure. on a regular basis. Yeah. So typically, if you're not paying attention to the sodium in your diet, which is basically just the salt in your diet, it's easy to do a lot more than your body needs, like 5,000 milligrams a day or even more. Really, we all need about like 25, 2300 milligrams a day. So really, when I'm counseling patients with kidney cancer, especially if they've had a nephrectomy and they only have one kidney now, you wanna be mindful with that mineral because it does put a lot of stress on the kidneys. Um, so just kind of looking at things that can keep you under that 2300, 2000 milligram mark is a safe place to keep it. Um, which doesn't mean that you can have like, I know we were talking earlier about like a salted pretzel occasionally, <laughs> like that kind of stuff is fine. But just thinking about like if you have 
big sodium intakes throughout the day, if you can swap out some options for some low sodium or salt-free options, it's gonna help keep you under that mark more consistently. And in addition to sodium, I, I've heard to keep an eye on, and maybe this is also for chronic kidney disease, mm -hmm. for potassium and phosphorus. Yep, exactly. Um, with those two nutrients and kidney cancer, we really don't start to restrict them unless someone is having elevated levels of it in their blood. And even then, there might be medical treatments that might come before the dietary changes, especially when we're thinking about what Meryl is saying, where you have aversions, you have a loss of appetite, there might be less control over what you're able to eat. And therefore, if you're really into baked potatoes, and you're having a slightly high level of potassium, I might not take that baked potato away until I know we absolutely have to because that might be the only calories you're getting that day. Fair enough, okay. So um, we're gonna move a little bit over to sort of quality of life and other things like that. So um, is there anything uh, you can advise on, I, I heard you know, protein to help to build back muscle mass. Um, any, any exercise tips or, or ideas? You, you mentioned staying active any, in biking. Uh, anything else? I just honestly think that whatever you like to do is what you're gonna do. Um, so do things you enjoy. Dance, uh, you know, walk, run, bike, swim, whatever will get you out there consistently moving. Um, the benefits are very dramatic in my opinion. Do you, Francesca, monitor this with patients, or do you do you have them uh, discuss what they're doing with you when they come in with, as part of the plan, their nutrition plan? Absolutely, yeah. I, I always promote physical activity. I always advise patients to discuss with their doctor before they start anything. But as part of their overall health, we definitely talk about ideas and barriers that might come into play when they're deciding to start physical activity or increase physical activity. Great, great. Well, folks, it looks like we're gonna take take a look at some of the questions that are coming in from the audience. So I'm gonna keep uh, asking you a couple of questions, but I'm gonna take a couple that are that are coming in. Sure. Um, and, and I'm gonna shift gears a little bit here. Is there anything that you can tell me about um, food security? Because I know we talk about you know being able to have access to certain foods. Some folks might not be able to to do that. Can you Can you comment on that for us? Yeah, definitely. Thank you for asking this question. I think it's really important um, a lot of people suffer from food insecurity generally, but especially anyone who's going through cancer might have an additional level of like what we call financial toxicity because of the extreme costs associated with being treated. And um, some people may not feel comfortable talking about this or uh, like realizing that there's resources to help with this. And there are, you know, um, if you're having trouble accessing food or accessing maybe the foods that you specifically need, I advise you to talk to your oncology team, your dietitian, your social worker, and find out if there's some resources because there's places you could get meals delivered to your house that are healthy. You could get groceries delivered to your house that are healthy. You can get um, dollars to use at a farmer's market. You can get food stamps. Um, so there are a lot of resources for this, especially for people who maybe are, you know, having this issue coming into this diagnosis, but also are having this issue due to this diagnosis. Yeah, and I think one of the things you pointed out is that we all should, and I'm gonna make this known to everybody, you know, make sure to stay in touch with your care team throughout all this. We're, we're having a conversation here, but there's nothing that, like actual medical advice from professionals that you need to take, take into account. Um, I do have one question here. Uh, what staple food items and kitchen devices do you keep around? Me? Yes. <laughs> oh, I, I am a convenience type person. <laughs> I, I have... Uh, Any snacks on hand? Yeah. <laughs> uh, protein bars, fruit, vegetables, um, some low uh, sodium carb sna uh, crackers and cheese. And uh, I, I like to have things at the ready that um, will you know, keep me snacking healthy foods. I don't cook a whole lot because I live on my own and so I um, have to get like a lot of convenience type foods for me to, to fix a good meal. But fortunately there's plenty of those out there and uh, I do 
to rely on those types of things. Yeah, and I'm curious. So there's a lot of things that you can have sort of at, at your your fingertips these days. Are there any um, you know tips that you can give anybody that they they should have uh, you know carry with them or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. So, and to go off what Meryl said too, like convenience is totally the way to go. Frozen veggies, canned veggies, they're all really healthy. Go for it. Doesn't have to be organic. It's healthy. You should keep that stuff it's stocked. But also nutrition drinks, I always say they're not a requirement, but they are a good convenience thing to have on hand. You're running out of the house. You're running to a doctor's appointment. Take the drink. You don't know how long you're going to be there, especially with COVID. You're wearing a mask. It might not be easy to eat. The drink is a good option. Um... The other thing I was going to add to that was that, um, I forgot what I was going to say. I'm sorry. Well, let, me, let me ask something here. I, so, some of the literature I've been reading, you know, I grew up three square meals a day is what you're supposed to have. I'm seeing five and six meals a day is now the new norm. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, eating less more often could be more feasible if you don't have a strong appetite. It could be easier to eat a little bit and then move on. If you're nauseous or you're having diarrhea, eating less at one time can also help avoid having those symptoms. Um, and if you don't have a lot of energy, it could be easier to just sit, eat a little bit, go back and rest, and then come back and try again later. Okay. I got another question here, which I hope we're answering with a, with a screenshot here, is can we share any resources for buying and preparing foods? And I think these two resources I mentioned earlier, um, if you can jot those down at home, those would be good resources to look at. Uh, shifting gears, um, you know, gluten or any dietary in, or dairy intolerance, any issues there or veg, for vegetarians, yeah. any special? Okay. I'll just mention what I was going to say earlier because I remembered. It was about the Cook for Your Life. On their website, they have a section of recipes that are like good to freeze. So those are good go-tos, like recipes that you can freeze well. So even if you're not buying convenience foods and you want to make something at home, freeze it for later. That's a great idea. And then as for the allergies, um, you know, if you have an allergy to something, you really should be avoiding it. Um, but if it's like a lactose intolerance, something like that, there's a lot of options for you to like take lactase pills, um, have lactose-free options or dairy-free options, um, or do more of like a plant-based diet where it's more vegetarian, more vegan options. So we're gonna have to wrap up here in just a second. A couple of quick comments. Um, can you give us, um, you know, any comments on your emotions that are going on along with the, the, the emotional, you know, responses that you're having to, to having to change maybe your, your nutrition or your food? You go through any of that? Um, my, my gut reaction to that is that by taking control and feeling like you're doing something to help yourself, that your, your general health, your kidney health, um, it really uplifted my emotions when I was able to really kind of get my arms around what I needed to do to stay healthy through all this. So, you know, you have cancer, but a lot of times, fortunately, we're able to live with it as a chronic type situation. And so being healthy and having control, it feels a lot better, you know, getting with someone like Francesca or, you know, doing research and knowing, you know, how to keep your body healthier and be active. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the endorphins is, is, that is all part of your emotional well-being. And like it changed very dramatically for me when I was able to shift into that mode after recovering from surgery and. and so taking control gave you some empowerment over this situation you're in. That's great, yes. great advice. Well, folks, unfortunately we've run out of time. Uh, that said, I'd like to remind you that this is the first of a three-part series on kidney cancer, and I encourage you to join us again when we discuss fitness and kidney cancer. And in case we didn't get around to answering your question today, please check back on the National Kidney Foundation or Kidney Can's Facebook pages, and we'll be posting the answers throughout the next coming days. And I'd like to thank our sponsors for their generous support in making this program possible. But especially I'd like to thank Meryl and Francesca for joining us today and helping to make this what is a very difficult subject for so many people easier to understand. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, you, Brian. Thank you. Great. On behalf of the National Kidney Foundation and Kidney Can, I'd like to wish you all good health.